It's one of our projects to come to an organization and kind of talk about leadership. And so I um, thought you, the chief, and the mayor would be great. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, so um, I guess we could go around and kind of introduce ourselves real quick. And then you kind of talk about a little bit about what you do, kind of your responsibilities with the city, right. and kind of how you lead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you know me. But... All right. You're up. Okay. Uh, my name is Matt Perry. I am from Sandy Springs. I work at Joe Tech. I've worked a lot of jobs in the startup community in Atlanta. I worked for Yelp out in Phoenix for a few years. I, more recently, after kind of being in the startup realm, Work for Ecolab, which is a pretty large Fortune 500 company in their wear washing division. And now I work as a project manager for an internet marketing company. Okay. My name is Anna Curry, and I'm originally from Mobile, Alabama, but from family background all over. And uh, is Mobile, that's the home of Mardi Gras, right? It is, the real home. I should know that. We have a it beef is. with New Orleans because they claim it. <laughs> You guys made it famous, but we'll find the video. So, um, <laughs> and I work for a uh, international youth development nonprofit. We're based here in Gwinnett, but work in a couple countries in Africa and Latin America, and then here in the U.S. I'm April Malls. I grew up in Gwinnett. I went to Tequila High School and um, work at Gwinnett Medical Center. I'm a physician liaison, and I work at the uh, Zulu campus. Okay, great. So I've been there for over 12 years. Okay, wow. So you've seen Gwinnett change. Oh yeah, especially Duluth. Duluth, yeah, yeah. Sam. So is he. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was telling them from the time that the city dump was in my backyard. Uh -huh. There's that old abandoned factory. Downtown was it's a chill shop and I don't know, not much other than that. To, to this, it's been yeah, incredible. Yeah, a violin shop and um, a thrift store. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing. <laughs> Which are, that's really what you want to do on Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's go to the violin shop and thrift store. No <laughs> restaurants. Play some uh, stringed instruments and go, right, right. go bargain hunting. I think I got my saxophone from there too. So I'm gonna play when I was a kid. But yeah, there's nothing. So this the change has been incredible over the years. So tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your history. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in Los Angeles and in, part. Uh, in right by uh, Pasadena, a place called Arcadia, California. Mm -hmm. so, Grew up in Arcadia, um, lived there my whole life until I was 30. My wife uh, grew up in Gwinnett County. We met when she was out there going to school. And so uh, we got married, lived there for two years. And then she just said, I want to move home. And I said, okay. I I've never lived, life. <laughs> yeah, I never lived really anywhere um, outside of Los Angeles. So I said, sure. So we moved here about 15 years ago and um, took a job up in Hall County. I worked in Hall County for a while as a planner, a community development director. I was, my, my background's in urban planning. Worked there for eight years, came to Duluth as the planning director. I was here for a year and then um, they had a change in management and said, hey, we'd like to be city manager. And so I've been doing that for about four and a half years. <laughs> But before, uh, before I came uh, to Georgia, I was a, uh, worked in a planning department in a small city in Los Angeles. Small in the sense that it was like ninety thousand people. Okay. Like big, Georgia, big compared to Georgia, like yeah. small compared small to Los Angeles, Angeles city. It's <laughs> pretty cool. Um, so I did that for seven years before I moved here, and so uh, I've got a wife, um, a little son. What kind of dog? Uh, he's a mix of a golden retriever and a chap. So he's a rescue. How old's your son? He's two. Just turned two. He's a tall two year old. He, he's, a, <laughs> uh, he's a little taller, but you know, I'm, a, I'm a little older. Um, so <laughs> my wife and I, we adopted him. So we're super excited. So he's, he's a handful. So mm -hmm. if, I know we were talking. I know your wife's expecting. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I'm 44. <laughs> and my back feels like I'm 54. So we <laughs> have two feeling. And we feel like we're all like, because we're all, we'll be about 30. When oh. oh. And so we're like, oh my <laughs> gosh. Because I, I know friends that are having it like 22, 21, and now they're like eight, nine years old. <laughs> so. Yeah. 
So it's uh, I started later in life, so it's a challenge. What made you interested in the planning, kind of the urban planning field? Yeah, I, I originally wanted to be an architect, and uh, I remember I applied to get into architecture school, and they said, no, you know, you didn't, you, know, you, you haven't been accepted, but if you go to the School of Urban Ranger Planning, wait it out, you could reapply, you know, two years and see if you mm -hmm. can get in. And my college uh, fraternity brother, my roommate, he was an architect major, and after living with him for a year, Studio. I, was, I no, thought, no. there's no way I could... He was so much more creative, so much brighter. I thought there's just no, I, I see what he's doing. And he's not, he, he wasn't the top of his class, but he was really good at what he did. I, I would say he was kind of middle of the road mm -hmm. in terms of the folks that were in that program. And I thought there's no way I'll, uh, mm -hmm. there's, it's just, these aren't the gifts I have. Yeah. So um, I ended up getting into planning and then uh, graduated, I went to graduate school and uh, I was expecting to be a, uh, I wanted to be in real estate development. And so uh, I went to USC and they're really tied in with a lot of uh, California real estate development companies. Mm -hmm. And so when I was there, I took an internship at a city because it was just something to do. Really. Mm -hmm. Started working there. And then they offered me a job, and I thought, well, I'll do this for a little while, and then I'll go work for a real estate developer, and I just never, <laughs> never did. <laughs> I, I always thought, oh, you know, this is the year I'm going to finally make that transition. Yeah. And then throughout my career, I've been kind of thinking about that, and right when I was getting ready to do it, it seemed like the economy was uh -huh. you know, slowing down or wobbling, and I thought, well, I'm still I think you're going to be stuck or forced to be stuck in this job for a long time. So. Yeah, now I'm kind of. <laughs> yeah, they're not going. I, I don't. I don't think they would. I don't think a developer would see me as the asset I once thought I was. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what? So what are your describe what kind of the responsibilities of the city manager? Yeah. Yeah. Far reaching. So, so I, I I think the simplest thing is it's look I kind of do oversee the day to day departments of the city. Mm -hmm. So the mayor, uh, unlike a lot of other cities, our mayor is a part-time uh, mayor. So, for example, city of Atlanta, you know, Kasim Reed and I think uh, Keisha Ms. Bonner, Keisha right? they're day-to-day -day mayors. You know, they come in, they actually operate kind of more like what you see um, other county mm -hmm. managers, city managers operate. They're just at a much bigger scale. But when you get down to kind of the smaller governments, most every one of those uh, elected officials is just part time. Mm -hmm. So they have someone who does the day to day things, who answers those phone calls for the lady who got her trash mm -hmm. can removed or something like that. So I supervise our department directors in terms of the day to day operations. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a mayor and council um, who provide policy and vision for the city. Mm -hmm. And so they kind of give me directive on making sure those policies and some of the, the vision they expect is being uh, handled along with the day-to-day -day, um, thing. So I'm not elected, I'm appointed. They are all elected by the citizens of Duluth. So I think really my job is probably twofold. It's one, do day-to-day -day operations, make sure you know lights come on, the roads get swept, you know, we have a police department, they're doing their thing, you know, someone gets a permit, those kinds of things. And then the council has kind of these bigger visionary things that they want us to work on. Mm -hmm. Those typically don't happen, you know, overnight. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we work on those projects for years. And sometimes we're still working on those projects and it takes some time. So those are kind of the two. And inside of that, you know, I'm <laughs> responsible to prepare the budget for the council. Um, oversee employee matters, those kinds of things. So how do you find enough hours in the day? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, I think like any job, you know, any job will take as many hours as you're willing to give it. Um, I, we have the luxury here of having some really, really good department directors. Mm -hmm. So like our chief of police has been the chief of police uh, for over 30 years. He's been a city employee for 40. So 
you know, I, I kid with him. Like when he became a city employee, I was four. So it was <laughs> like not really anything that I can tell yeah. the chief about how to be a better chief. Right. So my relationship with the chief is I've said, look, you know, if you need me or if we need to talk about an important issue, mm -hmm. you know, you can call me. But it would be silly for me to think that, hey, I'm going to come in and tell you how to be a chief after you've been doing it for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we luckily have um, several directors who have been really good and well-recognized regionally as uh, in their roles as director. So our city clerk is kind of the same way. She's been mm -hmm. clerk of the year in the state of Georgia. Um, so we have some really key people. So I think, you know, although I put in what I think is, you know, an appropriate amount of time, I rely on a lot of other good people too, mm -hmm. to be, to be successful um, and how to, you know, how to balance that. Some, sometimes there are seasons where because of the projects we're working on or, um, a certain circumstance that's come up that you do feel like you've mm -hmm. put some more time in, but, uh, you know, I think it's relying on some of the folks that we work with to know that, you know, this, this operation doesn't just rely on me being here every day. Yeah. And if it did, then I'm, I'm probably doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, if everything always comes to me and no one else feels slightly empowered, then that's probably not a good, good thing either. Yeah. I don't know if that answered. Yeah, no, that helps. Well. That's, that's good you have that good staff in place. And, you know, we have some younger staff members too who are really, really dedicated and good and uh, trying to give them the, the opportunities to grow. Uh, mm -hmm. I met with one of them the other day, a super great guy. And, you know, we're not the city of Dallas. You know, we have you know, with one director who does this department, we can't afford to have two. We don't have that many people. So there's only room for, you know, so many people. And I said, look, we'd love to have you here. We want to have you here. And we're going to try to find a little better role for you. But if you're here in 10 years, you mm -hmm. shouldn't be here in 10 years because the guy who's above you, he's doing a really good job. And this is probably his last job. So he's not going anywhere. Yeah. So you shouldn't be here in 10 years. If we're, if we're, bumping into each other in the hall, your life goals haven't been fulfilled. Like you need to yeah. find, a, you need to take what you're learning here, use your experience, find that better organization. You know, who knows, maybe things come around and years later you'll come back when mm -hmm. he retires. But, you know, for his growth and for his personal development, he, you know, he needs to be with us a couple more years and then he needs to get a better opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I wish we could, we could, you know, provide more growth, but you just, yeah, you don't need two police chiefs. You don't need five assistant police chiefs. You, right. know, you just don't, and you can't afford it. So. How many, how many employees are there? We have, well, full-time employees. Uh, we have any, it ranges, you know, depending on openings. We're like 161. Okay. And then part-time, you know, if you count day camp people, then it swells up to, you know, the twos. Okay. The day camp, is that usually during the summer? Mm -hmm. We have 161 full-time employees, and then we have, um, I don't know, something like the 15, 17 permanent part-time employees, mm -hmm. and then you have like your seasonal employees, like day camp people. Yeah. You get hired. To, we run like a children's day camp mm -hmm. uh, for summer. The summer yeah. camp. Okay. I'm calling it day camp. Summer camp. Here in Duluth. Yeah. Out of one of our parks. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah, and it's not a, it, it's kind of a, you know, old timey mm -hmm. summer camp. We don't go on fancy trips. We play in the field. We go to the fountain and we play ball. You know, yeah. it's just it's way more fun. They, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's some that are yeah. very extravagant trips and things like that. And mm -hmm. This is just yeah. come and play. Of the 161 full time people, how many are you directly responsible for? Or do you, like, hire? Maybe that's a better Yeah, I mean, I really, uh, my direct kind of uh, supervision, the folks that I write, I'll, I'll answer it this way. The folks that I write uh, performance evaluations for mm -hmm. are the, um, the six directors and then two managers. Okay. So those are the people 
so I do all the um, directors, and then we have two um, division managers that supervise. And things typically come to me outside of those people if and when something happens in that department, mm -hmm. and then they want to make kind of a decision that's not clear cut, and then we get, in my opinion, one or one. somebody runs over trash for me. <laughs> <laughs> Or so someone complains about the fireworks show, or right. you know. Just, yeah. Next time I need to complain, I know to call. Well, so or better, have a direct line to you. You, you, <laughs> you, you can do that, but I think maybe one of the the worst things that happen in local government, I say that in kind of joking way, is yeah. uh, email access. Because uh -huh. it used to be, like when I first started, email, it existed, just it wasn't as common. Right. And, um, if you really wanted to petition your government in some way, you had to come to a meeting. Mm -hmm. you, know, you had to come to a meeting or write a letter. And I remember, you know, when I first started, you used to get letters in the mail from people who were no, upset about it. something. And now, you you know, it's instantaneous. You can do it on your phone. You can do it you know, a thousand different ways to get in touch with us. So it's really easy for folks to complain. And oftentimes, um, what I think our technology does is it doesn't give you the ability to kind of think about what you're going to say. You just say it. Mm -hmm. So when something happened to you years ago, you'd have to go home, maybe write about it. And as you're writing about it, you're calming down. It's de-escalating. But now, you know, that just happened and I'm going to put all caps <laughs> and I'm going to send it and you're going to get it. And then I'm going to expect a call back. And so that, that's been a little different. Yeah. yeah how often so do you get emails like that? Uh, you know, it varies. Um, I'm actually saving my emails uh, for a coffee table book uh -huh. I have um, that I'm thinking someone might want to buy later in life yeah. about just crazy emails I've received. <laughs> yeah. And so I have like different categories. Uh -huh. So uh, one of my favorite categories is uh, I. Uh, the Nazi category. <laughs> that it's somewhere in the email they refer to me as a Nazi. Really? Yeah. Like, or they they refer to me <laughs> or the government I work for as a Nazi. And typically, it's awesome. something like. Um, it, typically, it's like, hey, you know, you came out and uh, you know my yard, my grass was higher than it should have been and so I was visited by the yard Nazi police you know those uh -huh. that's pretty so funny I get those um, because we run a police department I get a lot of uh, speeding traffic ticket that's what Duluth is known for so. oh, I yeah. get a lot of those are you a customer oh no I have not been a customer <laughs> um, <laughs> thankfully I'm not a customer I'm daughter, so careful so. in Duluth like, oh yeah I tell everybody people, hires, people like, always do more than five over and it's because my doctors are running back and forth, and they'll fly, and I'm like, well, I got pulled over, and who do you know? And I'm like, helping you with Duluth, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we, you know, there's that. Um, Nazi speeding, um, and then there's just all, all the other super random, random crazy yeah, stuff. Anti-government. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> and see, I only see the good stuff. I just see everybody happy and volunteering. And well, or sometimes it's... Stuff. You know, like the fireworks show. So I'll, I'll bet I probably got five emails with the fireworks show last year. So fireworks show last year, um, we had to move it. It's it's here on Town Green. And um, because of some of the development that's happened, we've had to move the location we shoot them. And when you shoot fireworks like the kind we shoot, the fire marshal comes out and they evaluate what you're shooting and the fallout zone and they rope off an area. And sometimes, depending on where they rope it off, it's like, oh, we really can't, you know, it's cutting into a, a parking field that we really would love to have parking, so we move it here and there. Mm -hmm. Well, we had kind of figured it out, and ultimately the location that it existed, um, when they ended up shooting the fireworks, for whatever reason, you know, fireworks, if you can imagine, as they go up in the air, the higher they go, the more expensive they are. And so whatever we paid for went up, let's say, this high. Well, from the location that they were shooting those, there was like a partial block view for people on town green because there's trees around. And so they were like, hey, 
you know, epic fail, you know, I'll never come to this again, it was ridiculous, you know, I couldn't see, I didn't see in the fireworks, and it's like, okay, you know, it was free, it's free, come on, gosh, I'm sorry we ruined your, get what you life. paid for, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. sorry, so we ruined America's birthday, and so it was like, epic fail, and why didn't you, you know, why didn't you let us park in that lot, well, we couldn't let you park in that lot, because the fire marshal said that's a fire marshal. When people have direct access to you with various methods of communication, how do you manage that effectively, given that Gwinnett is not only diverse in age and culture, um, but in numerous other ways, mm-hmm. the, the diversity in Gwinnett is, is vast. Yeah. How do you manage that? On a, what tactics have you employed to help deal with that workload? Yeah, I mean... I will tell you most of the time when it comes to me, there's all, I'm, I'm a little tipped off on what it might be about. Um, direct emails typically go to Kim, my administrative assistant, so she'll say, hey, you know, this looks like a, uh, they have a planning question, so I'll call over to planning and say, hey, what's this about in the background? <clears throat> so I, I try to typically get prepared. Um, most of the time, I think if you go into a strategy of, I really want to help this person, and oftentimes it's misinformation or they uh, were something happened where they just want to be heard. Sure. Is uh, probably 75% or 80%. There's, there's some are 20% and they just want to go off on somebody, <clears throat> hang up, and they don't want really, they just want to feel like they've got, they met someone's ear. But the other people, the majority of those people, just want to be heard and see if there's some way that you can sympathize with them and help them. Right. And uh, I would say in those cases, I do a lot of listening for the most part. Uh, in cases where we've had um, a language barrier, uh, we do have the ability to have interpreters assist us. We have some folks on our staff who speak uh, Spanish and who speak uh, Korean. And so we've had some- Do you have some people on your staff that have been in Gwinnett and speak, having been in Gwinnett for 40 years? Yeah, we do have, we have, we have, yeah, we have some, some folks who know quite a few people who have been here a while who can reach back to the, to the, to the uh, old timers. Yeah. And we have kind of a range of resources that we use. Mm-hmm. So, for example, um, we've got a guy over in our planning department, so our planning director, Bill Aiken. Uh, he grew up here in Gwinnett. Um, and, yeah, and so he grew up in Gwinnett, went to the Pie, went to Georgia. So he can really speak kind of from a, oh, yeah, I know that person I went to high school with his, uh, with his son. Or, oh, yeah, I remember that Nancy uh, Harris, our mayor, lived here you know, with the exception of college her whole life. Mm-hmm. Billy Joe, the same way. So we have you know, a lot of people that if someone calls, it's like, hey, we got a call from Bud Knox. I know you know him. Can we get together and talk together with Bud Knox? Because me saying something to Bud Knox means this much but me saying something to Bud Knox and Billy Jones saying yeah that's right Bud that's what we're trying to do <laughs> is yeah. kind of the difference um, so I think trying to just listen more to people oftentimes many of the complaints people have aren't necessarily about Duluth they're a little bit Duluth but they're maybe Gwinnett related or they're kind of a bigger issue and they just you know, they can call us, they can touch us and get mm-hmm. a hold of us pretty quickly. And so then we try to get them, you know, give them some extra help. So what I never do is say, well, you should go look that up on the website to yeah. call Gwinnett Water Resources. I said, hold on, let me get you that number. Right. And I'll give you that number and say, I'm going to send an email to them and let them know that you called me and that they might be expecting a call. Right. Kind of the... It's good service too. Yeah, like the Tip O'Neill kind of strategy mm-hmm. of how he who's Tip O'Neill Tip O'Neill was kind of an older leader uh, democratic leader this was like back in the 80s with the Reagan era and he was out of Massachusetts and his strategy was if people called his office and they talked to him and found out it was a local issue he yeah. would say no no you stay on the phone I'm going to call the city of so-and-so because you have a question about trash you're in my district yeah but it's not a federal issue 
you right. have a local issue. Let me get someone from the city of I'll empower you. I'll X you. on the phone. I'll get you on the phone and you can talk to them and I'll make sure they know that, you know, you've called me, you've taken the time to yeah. you know, go about it the right way. So mm-hmm. that's what we try to do for people here. That's awesome. Good that's cool. How do you balance, like, it sounds like a lot of your time and days around people and problem solving. So how do you balance kind of tasks that you have to get done and then people? I try to block out some time where I say, look, I'm, I can't, mm-hmm. I'm going to answer those phone calls later. Yeah. I've got to do this right now to put some time in. That's the okay. point I go into most days with. Sometimes gets hijacked. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, something yeah. serious happens. Mm-hmm. It's like, uh oh. But yeah, I think trying to at least come in with some strategy. Um, but that doesn't always work. No, it doesn't. Why not? Um, so I asked this to Mary Nancy also what is your like overall kind of or like what is your what would you define leadership as as like as you look at our not personal philosophy but kind of like it's leadership and then how do you kind of yeah I, I mean I'm thinking <laughs> it's a good question it's a good, it is a good question I, I know my dad's strategy he owned a small company he said there's two types of employees one that need a hug and a kiss and the other need a kick in the pants and everyone I've ever, who's ever worked for me needs a kick in the pants <laughs> <laughs> that was his strategy I'm like I don't know if people who that care about a whip yeah I'm like, I, daddy you know, that feels like something out of Mad Men but uh, I, I think my leadership strategy is uh, by example a little bit in the sense that if you really want people to listen to you and appreciate you you have to show that you're as committed as they are and we have some extremely committed employees so I think let them know how committed I am to try and do the right thing for the citizens and for the people I work with uh, is really important I think letting them know that that although ultimately it might be my decision I do value their opinion Mm -hmm. and that I'm not too egotistical to say you know I've I might have made a mistake there let me you're right that's what I was originally thinking let's not do that yeah so let's go a different direction the person before me was a former military guy and his kind of strategy was very look this is a dictatorship my and way the it's my way and that's just the way it's going to be and I, I it just to me it felt like it didn't Ultimately, he was going to be able to have the final say anyway, right. but to constantly remind people that I'm going to be the one who has the final say just doesn't, mm-hmm. to me, didn't really bring it up the opportunity to creativity yeah. that people have. I mean, if the only good ideas are his ideas, then people stop giving you ideas. Mm-hmm. So, And I, I think a lot of our employees, regardless of what their role here is, they have really good ideas on things. Mm-hmm. So there's been a couple of times when we've just got people that aren't maybe in a traditional planning perspective. Like when we did our redevelopment project, we had kind of a group of people from a different department. And we just all sat in a room and I said, look, you got to figure out this problem. Does anyone have any ideas? There's no really bad ideas, but you have to have ideas. Mm-hmm. If you're not going to bring ideas, we did in fact get rid of someone who literally had no ideas. And he was just always taking credit for other people's ideas. There's no point. Why are you here? Yeah. You know? And then he ultimately was having, he was taking kind of credit for some of the people who worked underneath him, their ideas, and it's passing them off as his own. I'm like, look, that's not what we're about. Mm-hmm. You, know, you need to be giving them an opportunity yeah. to shine a light on them. You know, the more light you shine on them, the more successful they will want to be, the more they buy in. We all, you know. Mm-hmm. Rising tide, you know, raises all boats. Yeah. But I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, definitely. It's easy to see why. Oh, I mean, like, it's easy to see how you and the mayor have similar, like, and similar answers to some of the other, just like the yeah. lead by example and kind of like. The well, and they, we've got a good group of folks here. Um, they're not corrupt. They really care about the community. 
they may differ on how they want to do something, but in their general core, they, they really want to do right by mm-hmm. the citizens. I, I couldn't, I would guess what I think their political affiliations are, but generally they leave those aside and their question they ask themselves most days is, is this good for Duluth or bad for Duluth? Not, is this a Democrat mm-hmm. position and a Democratic position or a Republican position? It's, you know, if we do this, we'll make someone's road better, house better, school better, you know. Mm-hmm. Those are their kind of strategies. So I respect them. I think that I respect them a lot. I think it's I think most of our employees respect them too. So that's kind of easy. If there are a lot of governments, it's kind of hard to respect the people at the top. Yeah. So but our folks are good. Yeah. And they're as committed as anybody. Yeah. Of the directors and managers that you saw before, how many existed in their positions before you came in and how many all of you, them all of them okay. all of them were, the, the exception of one now okay that, that you well I'm sorry the directors uh, what I'm serious uh, yeah the directors of the departments and the managers because you said you have six okay. yeah all and of them two. with the exception of one okay um, they basically took my spot after I became a director well, did you have to hire him I or was he was it? here then he left and then I rehired him okay. just built okay. yeah but uh, they were all here, and I think the one the of the department directors, the shortest tenure might have been like fifteen years. Okay. So they were fifteen years older. I think that says a lot. Too. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a lot of consistency there. So the fact is, when we didn't have a city manager for a little while, when we were in that interim, I'm not really sure anyone. Right, things ran pretty Yeah, well. trains ran on time, you know. Yeah. That's, I mean, it was it just... That's cool. Yeah. yeah, so that was a testament for sure for them. Yeah. For sure. That, you know, everything got done exactly the way that all these kind of been getting done. No disruption of service. Um, this may be uh, slightly outside of, but how does the city of Duluth, like, identify future leaders for the city if they do and like how would they yeah I don't know mm-hmm. recruit them yeah we have a, a program uh, it's called uh, mm-hmm. lead it's called lead and it stands for leadership educate advanced Duluth mm-hmm. and so anyone can participate it doesn't matter your age but the idea is to kind of get people to come see the entire aspect of Duluth and some of the organizations that exist in Duluth give them kind of a crash course and you know, this is your community good and bad and it's a great program I really enjoy it so and it's I think the good thing about it is although it talks about a lot of the good things we're doing it really you know shed some light on some things we still have to work on there's mm-hmm. no doubt about that mm-hmm. um, so you know we we've had a lot of people who've matriculated their way up uh, to be city council members from that program. Look, right now we have <laughs> at least, I know of at least two council members, Kelly yeah. Hill and Kirkland were in the lead program and then, you know, found their way onto a board or a commission and then found their way into council. So there is some process from the leaders that we have now that you get to learn more about the community you're, mm-hmm. you're going you want to serve they get to learn more about you so when you get here you know you <coughs> kind of at least have a basic understanding of you know what we're trying to accomplish what we do what we can't do right. um, so maybe even in previous positions you have what are you looking for in leadership or like people you're hiring, like what kind of qualities and behaviors or type of people are you looking for? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think for this organization, we have uh, there's a little bit of a culture here mm-hmm. of stability, consistency, personal respect. So, um, you know, when I look to see people who might fit in here. They may be really, let's call them A plus and A plus in terms of their skill set, but if 
succeeding to them is them getting the credit for something, mm -hmm. they may not be a good fit here. Mm -hmm. um, our group, we have a lot of unselfish employees that would enjoy the city getting the credit. And so if you have that one employee who kind of really you know, expects to have the shop spotlight on them all the time. I think they would find it hard to get along with some of our other employees. At the same time, um, we're looking for people that uh, want to be creative and, um, you know, really, really are going to uh, kind of appreciate working with other employees on a team kind of approach. From a leadership standpoint, when you see those people who kind of want to be in the spotlight and want to be in the sun, how do you try to approach them to see if that's something that they can change and, and grow from, or do you tend to give them the axe? Yeah, no, um, I'll give you a good example. Uh, we had an employee here, I'm not going to say whether, I don't know if you know her. I was going to try to say whether you know her. I was going to say, I'm not going to say whether you know her. Anyway, um, she, so she was, uh, she was that employee and she was good at what she did, but it was always at the expense of other employees. And so, uh, for a while, I really tried to put her into situations that were structured to where she had to be working with other people. She wasn't above them. She wasn't below them. She was just a team environment. And uh, we just could not get it to work. And ultimately, you know, I sat down and said, look, this, you've got to, you, you've got to stop attempting to undercut some of these other folks. You know, they're as committed, they're bringing a different view. And ultimately what happened in her situation, she realized that she was the one that was not, not fitting in. She ended up moving up, moving on on her own. She's a super nice person, um, but she's since had, you know, two or three jobs because that's, mm -hmm. I don't know why. She just, you know, it was, it, her success would always had to be at the expense of another employee and uh, just didn't, it didn't, didn't make a lot of sense. So in her case, um, trying to get her to get in environments where she could perhaps change her attitudes was a strategy we used, was not successful. Um, we had another employee, like I mentioned, that he was didn't he just didn't want to commit to having creative ideas and was using other people's ideas. And it was obvious to me that the folks underneath him stopped respecting him. And it soon became pretty apparent that he was kind of leading by title and really not leading. And so they would just go along with him because was his title, not because they believed what he was saying. And so in that case, it was just obvious he wasn't going to change. And I said, this isn't working out. Um, and he, and I had hired him and that was my fault. And, you know, I, it wasn't too long after, you know, I kind of thought, you know, some of the things that came across during the interview process and during the conversations we had, just, he was really good at that, but you know, when the rubber met the road, he just, mm -hmm. he just didn't want to dig in. Um, and ultimately, it was something I probably waited too long to do. I mean, it was it was probably a year. I knew six months or a year before that I should do something about it, and I just didn't. How long was the year for? This year, almost two years. And I knew it, I knew it a year in, and I should have done something about it. But I blamed it on, oh, I'm, just, I'm so busy, I just gotta get done with this one big project. As soon as I get done with that big project, then I'm gonna focus on it. And then like this other big project came up, oh, okay, this is it, I promised to myself, as soon as I get done with that, then I'm gonna do something about it. And it, I, I wasn't doing it right, but I was, yeah. It's gotta be a tough decision to make though, especially if you hire them. Yeah, and, and it wasn't that I was. I've never been put in that situation. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it wasn't that it's not I, personal. Yeah, and it wasn't that I was didn't want to admit that I had made the mistake, because I do think out of the people we interviewed and the uh, you know the process we went through, I I still think he was the right person to hire. Mm -hmm. You know, but then it was 
then I realized, you know, maybe I, you know, during that first six months when I knew things were going wrong, I didn't do a lot of course correction. Yeah. And at some point it just got, at some point it started to bleed over outside of just our staff and into our elected officials. And when that happened, I had that choice. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, things have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. so. What do you think from a leadership standpoint and especially working with people who are so passionate about the city is the hardest part of, of being a leader? Hmm. So sometimes um, some of our employees' passion can spill over uh, in a way that they don't realize that ultimately our elected officials are the ones who make the decisions. So no matter how much we might want something from an elected official, they have to be the ones to decide that and if they don't then we have to accept that and move on and so I think sometimes staff members you know work on something and uh, you feel like this is just a no-brainer why wouldn't the council approve this and then they don't and somehow you feel like that's been personal mm -hmm. uh, and you know you've got to set that aside and kind of keep moving forward and so I think we have some employees there's two sides to that. The, the passion, you really want to have employees that are passionate, but then they also need to be able to control the days when something doesn't go their way. And they need to say, okay, I got it. I just keep moving forward. Um, I think that's hard for some of our employees. That's hard for me too. <clears throat> you, know, you really feel like you put in a lot of time and you're away from your family, you're putting this in. You've got, finally got this one great project. All they need to do is just vote and it happens and mm -hmm. it just doesn't. And then you kind of ask why and the reasons don't seem as noble as you might have thought they might have thought they should have been. And it's like Does that happen a lot or no, not here. But I've worked in other places where it happens. I can imagine that would be hard, especially if you're putting your blood, sweat and tears in it and other people are Yeah, yeah you're trying really hard to convince you know, get these things to line up and it finally happens and then someone for political reasons, it's just decided they, they just don't want to do, or, you know, just don't want to do it. You know, or they do want to do something, they're like, oh, it's a really bad decision. Do you, did you witness, like, people leaving? Or was it that drastic? Or no, was it, I think you like, get to a point. My feelings are hurt. And yeah, no, I, I think some people, their feelings get hurt. Oftentimes they get over that. I think if it goes on too often, you start to feel like maybe this isn't the right when organization for me. Because, right? mm -hmm. you know, the fact is we only have so much time here. Right. And it's like, look, if I'm going to really put in a certain part of my life in a community, I'd like to see something, something from result it. from this. Sure. And for me, you know, after a while, it's not a theoretical exercise. It's like we're really working hard to make someone's life better. And, you know, some of the people you work for just don't do that then you either accept that and I think if you do that it's really hard to stay passionate about your job very much the case yeah. so, and I get it you know it's still a job right so this is fun but it's, it's still got it's days where it's like this is this is a job <laughs> but trying to balance that out is probably you know good I, I mean I don't know if there's something I really want to do where I'd say, oh, that doesn't feel like a job. And I'm sure it's out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All of our guidance counselors have failed so miserably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, does anybody have any other questions before we go meet the chief? Or? Sure, one last one just about communication because um, I'm sure with all the different projects and communication is probably pretty vital. What are like some effective communication, I don't know, strategies or things you found that work? Well, so communicating with the council varies. Uh, some of our councils, council members prefer emails because it's just easy to... Like just something. in the form of like, hey, information, here you go. Information, here you go. Some don't want, some want, I want every bit of information you have I want to see the entire analysis on something. I want to see everything that you know or that your staff knows. I want all the background documents. Some say, I don't want to see that. I just want to get the bullet points. The bullet points in your recommendation. 
Others say, don't send me that. Just call me on the phone. We'll have a conversation. Right. It. <laughs> and that's kind of, and they vary. Good. And depending on the topic, they vary. But those are kind of our three, how to communicate with counsel. So you kind of have to know. Yeah. You got to, what, you, you know, the, I think part of what I do maybe more than anything now that I'm thinking about what you ask me on job is this kind of the care and feeding of the council. You know, some of them want information about certain things. Some of them want it this way. Some want it that way. Some just want, like I'll get a call saying, hey, I've got someone. Can you tell me what the status of uh, Pleasant Hill widening is? Well, I call the county, find out what the status is. I could send that email knowing that they get a bunch of emails and they might miss that email. Or I call them on the phone and say, hey, do you have a specific question? Yeah, I have a friend who lives two doors down off of whatever road. He just wants to know, is it this year, next year, two years? When's it going to start? It's going to start in 2020. I'm making it simple. Yeah. Right. It's going to start in 2020. Shouldn't be a problem. If you ask him questions, he can go to that website. Okay, no problem. I'll get it to him. So it just depends. Council mm-hmm. member day by day, issue by issue. Um, communicating with our staff. Uh, typically, if it's a director, I'll just pick up the phone. Unless it's a request that comes from a council that I want to have some accountability to, then I'll forward an email and track it mm-hmm. and say, hey, can, would you mind responding to the mayor? Yeah. Copy me back on it. And so, you know, I close that loop. Yeah. So it just kind of depends. Yeah. But if it's a director, I'll just pick up the phone. And oftentimes, if it's a request coming through from a council member, I'll pick up the phone and say, hey, I'm going to send you an email from Mayor Harris. Would you mind making sure you respond to me? Because, you know, you how many emails do you get a day, right? I don't want, I, I legitimately get in and out probably 70 emails. 70 emails a day. So it's, if you, if that's in and out, so. You might, you might miss one or you might go past it or whatever. And so if it's something that I know, like my bosses want, then I call and say, hey, make that a priority. Mm-hmm. I don't just click the high priority the call. Like, hey, <laughs> dude. This I is that. important. This is important. Please give me a response. I want to get this kind of not checked what about, off the list. Okay, so it's like a lot of communication this way. What about people working for the city? Communication less. It varies. Some departments uh, do a really good job. They have their uh, weekly staff meetings, like Teresa's. Uh, hers are um, emails and um, in-person meetings, but all of her employees are on, this, on the second floor, okay. or on the first floor. Okay. So the police department, it. totally different. They have 80, 80 people over there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Multiple shifts. You know, Some people don't see people... Okay. Yeah, they've got a whole 911 center where if you call 911, they're over there and they work these crazy hours. So mm-hmm. you just, you know, theirs are a series of communication. Right. Through They have a very structured, I don't be curious to see what the chief says, but they have a very structured kind of chain of command for those reasons because they have so many different people right. doing different shifts, doing different things. Yeah. The, the mayor told us to ask you about your philosophy on what paid parking on paid no, parking just parking in general, parking right? in general? Just paying park. for parking paying for parking I don't believe in it is that what she I mean like the parking the the Duluth parking issue oh there is no parking issue who <laughs> no that's what, she said. that's what she said you would say that's yeah. what she said yeah because yeah. people find a place to park people find a place to park <laughs> I, I <laughs> having work I used to work with the Duluth Health Festival for the hospital uh-huh. yeah and literally people will find a place to park it does not matter where. It doesn't matter what they're on top of. They will find a place to park. We to people all the time. They're like, hey, what do you think about parking in downtown? And I said, I'll just be honest with you. I've never been to a cool area of any town that parking was just all. Of, you just park I'm, wherever you wanted. I've Every cool that. area I've ever been to. <laughs> it's true. Has people, and you got to find a place to park and a walk. It, but it's cool, so I'll do it. And the problem with what we're encountering here particularly in Gwinnett, is uh, historically the urban forums have been you drive up, you park in front of your restaurant, and you go. Right. And our strategy down here is we have multiple di- dispersed Parkable. lots where you park different places. You might have to walk by five businesses to go where you want to go, but it's the experience that you're trying to get. And so 
certain people get that. I get the idea most of you get that. But, you know, we still have the older Duluthians who are like, hey, I want to pull up and just walk, it. walk into Chili's. That's what I've been doing for 25 years. Right. I can't do that anymore. You can't do it. The Chili's parking lot still has a spot open. Yeah. It's, yeah. <laughs> Golden Crowds. That's exactly right. <laughs> See, I have a year plus because I've never had an issue. God almighty. Yeah, you also, also no. just, uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't yeah. really have, he doesn't really have a commute issue to yeah. well the problem now is now a lot of my colleagues at work know that and so I'll, I'll see their cars in my driveway now. yeah so yeah that's not a yeah, how big is that parking deck going to be again 300 with the with the hotel I think it's close it's a high 300s and we have 190 I mean, I'm trying to beat the hotel to build my house before uh-huh. they start building because we're going to stage it in the parking so, oh yeah, yeah. You better hurry then. Yeah, so I'm gonna put the the big 18 wheelers behind the parking lot. So you better do that soon. Now, <laughs> do you have a permit for that? I think I know someone. Yeah, uh-huh. I'll just call and complain. So. Yeah, call. Yeah, yeah, I've been talking to him. He, he says no issues. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank Enjoy you. Thanks, you guys. Like yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks. Good luck. Have uh, have fun uh, with the with the chief. Yeah. I want to see if we can see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We'll go. They have a. We have a crime lab over there. What? Oh, yeah, we have yeah, our own. Yeah. yeah, we have our own crime lab. Ask him. Like, we, I would be very interested. In like this we thing. snagged. Uh, I don't know how much how much uh, marijuana I have over there today, but we normally keep. We have a lot of marijuana. We, have a lot. we had to have like the containers, the shipping containers. It seems to come through the loop. But. Well, and we're part of like a multi-agency task force, mm-hmm. so sometimes we store it. But ask him if he always has a story about driving. <laughs> yeah. And ask him about the cars that have the rockets on. I was just telling him. <laughs> yeah. How do I get one of those rockets? I know. Yeah, that's right. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Have a great day. I did remember it, and I didn't ask. I wonder if we should just ride with you for the sake of time so you're not making this. I will. I don't like people waiting on me. Yeah, these are all my friends. Those are your Thank you. Have a great Done. One more. Um, One.